Welcome everybody. So it's a computing seminar and I have tried to stick in uh, computing ideas and themes wherever I could. It's not going to be super, super heavy. It, there's lots of nice figures, hopefully to bring students along uh, and build up a little bit of intuition about how seismology works. And in particular, this thing called seismic imaging. Um, so I'm gonna start off for those of you who have never met a seismologist or heard of a seismologist, but um, seismology is the study of earthquakes, right? And uh, the big thing that earthquakes do is they shake the ground and they generate these things called seismic waves. And so myself and my students spend a whole lot of time analyzing things called seismograms. And let me put on my little spotlight, but can people see that? No spotlight. All right. Uh, oh, well, I see it. little wiggles uh, over here on this piece of paper are our time series and they're sort of telling us how the ground is shaking at any given location. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that seismic waves are just energy moving through the earth and they can be caused either by earthquakes and rocks breaking or an explosion from a, a bomb or something else or impacts. So an impact from a hammer or an impact from a meteorite. And our goal is to sort of use these waves to say something either about the source that created them or something about the material that they propagated through. Okay, so you'll hear me use this phrase, source imaging or monitoring or structure imaging or monitoring. And that's what that means. By structure, we just mean the structure of the earth. And we record these waves on seismographs or we now more often refer to them as seismometers. So here's just an example of a, a, comp, a computed wave field. And since uh, a lot of people on this call may have been here in March last year, this is the earthquake that shook us all on March 31st. Um, so it's a, a numerical simulation. You can see it's originating from Idaho and then propagating out much like if you dropped a rock into a pool, okay? So what you're seeing right now are the waves that are propagating across the surface of the earth. There are also waves that are diving down into the earth and going through the core and the mantle and showing up in other parts of earth. And so we use simulation like this a lot um, to propagate waves from a source, as well as to see how waves are influenced by heterogeneous structure in the earth. So you can see over here, you had nice smooth wave fronts, but after they've propagated through the Eastern US, you start to see that there's some kind of structure and those wave fronts are a little bit more jagged. Um, whereas out in the ocean through the oceanic crust, it's still nice and smooth. So we try to use these changes in the wave field that we observe to say something about the 3D structure of the earth as well as the source. And I'm gonna reverse this really quick and draw your attention to the radiation that you see. So we call this a radiation pattern. If I go back maybe a little further and we look at the very first wave that comes out, you can actually see it goes red, blue, red, blue on this outer sphere, and then blue, red, blue, red on this inner sphere. And what you're seeing which is different than if you dropped a rock into a pond, is that there's changes in polarity of the wave depending on which direction they're propagating. And that is entirely due to the fact that this is an earthquake rupture along a plane. And so when you have earthquake rupture along a plane, you don't get a nice homogeneous wave. You get something that has these zones of positive and negative, as well as this thing called a nodal plane. And so the way that we actually can tell what the rupture looked like is by putting receivers all around and then observing at places like along this direction where there actually is no wave field. So it's, it's nothing here. We call it a nodal plane because it's a null. On this side, it's a positive displacement. On this side, it's a negative. And when you cross that boundary, there's nothing happening. And so, this is what happens when we have what's called a moment tensor source. And you can just think of it as a rock breaking along some kind of plane. And in seismology, we often record on three components. 
So we record the vertical direction and the X, Y, Z, or sorry, the X and the Y, which usually we use north, south, and east, west. And I just wanna show these videos because the next one I'm gonna show gets really complicated because it's a superposition of all these things. But we have different kinds of waves. The top row are called body waves. These are waves that dive down into the earth and go through the body of the earth. There are compression waves or P waves, which everybody has heard of or at least experienced. That's a sound wave when I'm talking to you right now. It's a compression wave in the atmosphere. And the key here is that this little black box is the particle and it's moving in the direction of the wave propagation. So you can recreate this one with a slinky really easy. We also have shear waves. This is where the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. And then we have surface waves. And these are the ones that get stuck on the surface. We have Rayleigh waves. So these are what we call elliptical motion. They move up and down and side to side. And then we have love waves. And these just move side to side along the surface of the earth with highest amplitudes at the surface. And they decrease as you go deeper into the earth. And these two surface waves are the ones that cause a lot of destruction in the earth, uh, or I should say at the earth's surface when we have an earthquake. And so the, the thing to keep in mind from a computing point of view is that an elastic wave field is a vector wave field. And we'll, we'll get to that later when we talk about the equation of motion. And so what I wanna show you now is just a, a pretty cool simulation on the right of an earthquake uh, that happened in 2007 in Sumatra. The wave is gonna come in from the upper left and propagate towards the lower right. On the left-hand side is a predicted wave or a modeled wave using a simulation. And on the right is, or sorry, the left is the actual observed wave. And you're gonna see two things. Each dot here is a seismometer. It's either gonna be blue or red, depending on if the, the motion of the earth is moving up or down. And then you're gonna see these little arrows, which are actually telling you which direction the particle at the surface of the earth is moving. So it can move forward or backwards, it can move left or right, or it can be some kind of weird combination of those. And I wanna show you this to highlight sort of what we can model and what we can't model. And you can see this really nicely when you watch this video. So there's some primary or compression waves coming through. Some S waves coming through. And pay attention over here, these things start to get really funky. And so you can see if you compare our little pointed arrows, what the particle motion is doing in our simulated wave field, because it's a very simple velocity model, everything looks nice and sort of continuous. Things all move together. Um, whereas over here, you start to see really interesting stuff happen. And this is actually coming from the 3D structure of the earth. And so what we would really like to be able to do as seismologists is predict this kind of behavior, okay? Um, and you can see as you keep going along in this video at certain places, we start even missing complete parts of the wave field. And I don't remember if I'm gonna remember exactly where it is, but you can start to see here, there's actually changes. So the wave is moving up instead of down, whereas we completely miss that over here. And so our goal as seismologists, when we say that we wanna resolve the structure of the earth is we wanna resolve it to the degree that then we can predict it. And so the reason that we wanna predict things is from a hazard point of view for the most part. And um, well, at least my reasoning. And this is just an example to show you maybe how well we actually do. So these are time series at different locations. So North Africa, Europe, and this is the Amatrice earthquake in Italy. And what you see is we have this, in this particular paper, SizeSol is their simulated uh, numerical method. They do a really good job sometimes of recreating the wave field in black. And then they do a really poor job sometimes of recreating the wave field in red. 
And so for this example, they actually do a good job of all the wave field. In this example, they do a good job of the first part of the wave field, but not the second part. And then in this particular case, they do a really bad job of matching the amplitudes of these late service waves. And what you'll notice is these things usually happen in basins. So deep basins where the bedrock is deep and they're filled with sediments. And that's actually where most cities are built. So LA sits on a big basin, Tokyo sits in a big basin, Seattle sits in a big basin. And what we have a really hard time currently doing is modeling the ground shaking in these basins because we don't actually have a good 3D structure model of the earth in those areas. And the key thing to take away just from a hazard point of view is that these waves don't die down really quickly like they do here and they last for a really long time. So if you're in one of these basins, the shaking is stronger and it lasts longer. And it, I thought I'd just show some pictures and motivation of why we might wanna be able to produce or predict the really small scale heterogeneity of the earth. And that's because of things like this. So this is in Japan, an earthquake happened. And in these buildings, the ground actually kept its, uh, let's say rigid structure. Whereas underneath this building and this building, it lost all of its rigid structure and the whole building just tipped over. And that happens due to something called liquefaction. So the, the solid ground turns into a liquid. And another example is just this car. So ground shaking started and the subsurface turned to a liquid and the car sunk. And these things happen on really small scales. So we're talking about hundreds of meters to tens of meters. And you can see that in here. These buildings fell over, these buildings didn't. Um, so when we talk about being able to predict the wave field, it kind of happens at a whole lot of scales. Just some more examples. So we have strong shaking, which can uh, sort of shake buildings loose. This is an example from a building in Utah where the brick broke loose during shaking and collapsed. This is one where a road completely separated. And this is one over here in Christchurch, New Zealand, where it shook so much that the house tilted and now it's condemned. And so there's a whole variety of infrastructure um, destruction that can happen during uh, strong shaking. And so we would like to be able to, pr to predict that so that then we can engineer buildings to, and roads and infrastructure to withstand this kind of stuff. And then the last hazard I'm gonna talk about is um, we would like to know or be able to image the sources of earthquakes very accurately so that we can tell if it was a source that's going to create a tsunami or not create a tsunami. And this is just one example of the Tohoku earthquake in Japan from 2011 showing the tsunami. So this is a tsunami that's big enough to pick up a van, throw it over the edge of this bridge, and then keep pushing it down the streets. I think everybody knows that this caused a lot of damage. And it came from our inability to accurately say how the source moved through time and how much this fault actually moved. And then I put down here, there's all kinds of other landslides or other hazards. So landslides, volcano lahars, pyroclastic density currents, snow avalanches, there's a whole variety of things that we can observe and that generate seismic waves that we would like to be able to understand. Um, <clears throat> we also are interested in things, uh, let's say structure for things like petroleum resources. So if you didn't know that how your oil is found for your car, it's usually a seismologist who was out doing a seismic experiment. And this is an example in the ocean, they shoot off an air gun, it sends waves that go through the water into the crust and they reflect back off of changes in the velocity or the density of the subsurface and go up to these hydrophones, which is just a geophone in water. Um, and what we look for are gas and crude oil or water and other things. And the images that we create are this thing on the top. So this is a reflectivity image and it's telling you what is <clears throat> the reflection at an interface. So we all took optics. We all know how light bends when it comes to a change in two material properties. The same thing happens in seismology with elastic waves. 
And then what we can do is make interpretations. So you see people here have drawn in faults. Up here, they've drawn in this little brick thing. That's a carbonate. That's a good spot where they might go drill to find oil. Um, and then other sedimentary layers, they can sort of distinguish the different layers and how thick they are and maybe what they're composed of. So from a resource point of view, seismology has lots of applications. And then <clears throat> something that's come up more recently and is falls sort of into this field of environmental seismology is trying to understand dynamic processes that are happening at the Earth's surface using seismic observations. And so in black here is the amplitude of seismic waves through time. And we call these tremors. And if you've ever seen this movie, awesome. If you haven't seen this movie, you should go check it out. It's very entertaining, but it's a different kind of tremor. Um, and over the top of that is the discharge at a glacial outlet stream. Okay. And so this is through the summer, the glacier is melting, water is going down beneath the glacier and running out. And they put a discharge meter at the glacier mouth and they measure how much water comes out. And you can see there's a, almost a perfect correlation between the amplitude of the seismic waves that are being generated and the discharge of the water. And so we can start to think about what are all the cool ways that we could observe dynamic processes at Earth's surface. And we call these sort of fluvial, geomorphological, glacial processes. Any of these things that are changing through time, uh, we want to monitor. And then the last one that I'm going to show is another really cool study that came out last year where we're able to actually monitor a typhoon with seismic waves and start developing some relationships between the characteristics of the seismic wave and how fast the typhoon is moving. So they used an array over here of sensors in Southern California and they did an imaging method and the imaging each day produces one of these little colored dots. And in the light pink dots are the location of the eye of the typhoon from satellite images. And so what you can see is we can really actually follow the typhoon until it starts to die off. The other cool thing is that we can see that the frequency in the wave, which we're just going to call cutoff period, is somehow correlated to the propagation speed of this typhoon. So as the typhoon moves faster, we see higher frequencies. And as the typhoon moves slower, we see lower frequencies. And so this is back to this idea of source imaging and monitoring. We're looking for ways that we can study dynamic sources at Earth's surface. All right, so that's my motivation for why we wanna do all of these things related to sources and structure. But since this is a, a computing seminar and uh, I'm a seismologist. I thought I would throw in here sort of an idea of all the tools that we use for the students who are out there and might be interested in this. Um, so if you do lots of math classes, you're going to come encounter all of these different things. But Fourier series, Fourier transforms, numerical integration, vector matrix calculations, um, vector field operations. So the elastic wave field, we need the curl and the divergence and then computing skills. So um, just so that you all sort of know where we're coming at, we try to give all these skills to our students when they go into our master's or PhD programs over in the geophysics degrees. And hence they take lots of the math classes and computing classes at BSU. Um, so let's dig into seismology a little bit. There's two ways that we think about um, waves. Okay, and the first one is, and these are super old school videos. I think someone took these off of VCR and converted them to digital. But <clears throat> we think about waves and wave fronts. So here is an example. Here is the earth. It's half of the earth in a 2D view. You have the core and the mantle. And we just shot off an earthquake or we blew up a bomb underground right here. And we're watching the waves propagate. And up here at 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees, we're watching how the surface of the Earth is moving. So you can see that as waves come through, 
So that wave right there just came through. That's an S wave. Then we're going to see this other wave that sort of reflected off this boundary is about to come in. So that's the SCS. It means it went down as an S wave to the core and it came up as an S wave. And then we start to see stuff come in at 60 degrees and 90 degrees. And the thing I want you to remember here is we're just looking at a wave propagating. So we're looking at the wave front. Um, this is a simulation of a, an elastic wave equation that gives us this. And then over on the right, the other way that we think about things is in terms of rays. And so this is what everybody sort of encounters in their physics too when they do optics. We think about shooting a wave or a ray of light, it hits a boundary and it refracts and goes somewhere else. So now what they've done is color coded all of these things. So the direct S wave, this first thing, this thing, and you can see it never shows up at 90, is propagating as these green lines. And the thing to keep in mind is that a ray is just the line that is normal to the wave front over here. Then we see all these different things happening. These white ones are going down and diving and then coming back up. That's due to the velocity structure of the earth. On average, it's slow up here and fast as you go deeper in the earth. And so um, Snell's law implies that you're gonna get waves that bend. And so these are the two ways that we think about waves. And the reason I bring that up is because when we talk about imaging, we're gonna look at the first method of imaging that's your traditional computer array tomography, your CAT scan that everybody knows about uses rays. And then when we get to the more sophisticated stuff later on, when we talk about full waveform tomography, we're gonna to be using wave fronts and no longer rays. And so in the traditional sense, seismologists put out sensors that record in the north, south, the east, west, and the vertical direction. So Z, N, and E, and then we rotate those. So this is where our vector uh, mathematics come in. We rotate the north and the south and the east and the west to this thing called the radial and the transverse. And so radial is the direction that points from a source to the receiver. And the transverse is the component that is orthogonal to that. So on the radial, we see Rayleigh waves. And on the transverse, we see love waves. And that's because remember, think about you have directions of propagation and particle motion changes depending on what type of wave you have. And so this is called a seismogram. We have three components. And I want to show a little bit about the math that we use to describe a seismogram. So the waveforms are a combination of usually three things. So U naught here is our observed wave field. We usually use U to rep represent the displacement at observed at some location R. And I wrote this in the frequency domain. So it's a, a multiplication or a convolution in the time domain. It's a combination of the source. So some source at R zero uh, that depends on or can change with frequency, I should say. And then I forgot to change this. It should say G to match down here. But this is a Green's function or uh, uh, the propagation that describes how the wave propagates from the source to the receiver. And then the imprint of the recording instrument, which we call the instrument response or I. And so normally we would combine the Green's function with the source to write the actual wave field and then convolve it with the instrument response. And at the end of the day, what we want is to remove the instrument response from the observed wave field so that we just have U. And we do that through a process that's called deconvolution. And what that enables us to do is compare the wave field at different places on earth that were recorded by different instruments. So uh, we remove that instrument. And then <clears throat> down here, we wanna be able to isolate or study S for source imaging and monitoring, and or we want G or this P thing up here for the structure imaging and monitoring. So this one tells us about the velocity of the Earth's crust. This one tells us about the source. And so we're gonna get a little bit into the math just since it's a computing seminar and I didn't wanna leave this out, uh, but we will talk about it. So, um, it's going to come back later when we talk about where this field is going. So this is the uh, elastic 
isotropic wave equation. You have density, a second derivative in time of the displacement field is equal to a spatial derivative times this stress plus whatever your moment tensor is doing. So this big M here describes stress in one direction on a plane that's oriented in one direction, hence the two components. So <clears throat> your stress perturbations and your source plus then something called a volumetric source. So you can think of these are like your impacts, okay? And now these are related via our strain tensor and this is where the isotropic component comes in. So your stress is related to your strains via two constants in this case, lambda and mu. So these are the two Lamé coefficients. This is the isotropic elastic case. These can vary with space, but there's only two coefficients. If we go to anisotropic or full anisotropy, this becomes 81 elastic coefficients that are in what's called the stress, uh, sorry, the elasticity tensor, or some people may have heard of it as the compliance tensor. Those are just inversely related. Um, so this is how the stress is related through physical properties of the earth. So when we wanna understand the earth, we either wanna understand lambda or mu or some combination of those, as well as the density. And then strain is related to our displacements via these partial spatial derivatives, okay? And the indices here, i, j, k, l, follow Einstein no summation notation, and they change based on the dimension of your problem. So I wrote one, two, three here if we were working in a 3D earth, okay? Um, so there's a hyperbolic PDE. What we often end up doing from a, a numerical point of view is we transform that into the velocity stress equation. And all that means is that we actually write V here, which is the one single time derivative of U. And now we have a first order partial differential equation where we have time derivative in the first order with the velocity field. And then we have time derivatives on our stress and our strains. And we do that because this is just much easier to solve from a numerical point of view. Okay, so this is anytime that you hear a seismologist talk, they're solving sort of the quintessential hyperbolic uh, PDE. And so where we're at now is you can take your pick. Uh, you have Donna, Michal, Grady, they can all explain how to do these different methods much better than I can. Um, but we often end up looking in the seismic literature or I should say people producing code for us that's either finite differences, finite elements or spectral elements. Donna specializes in finite volumes. I don't know a whole lot about them. Um, I'm gonna put this out as for any students who are interested. Um, there's a new computational seismology book where they actually go through all these methods um, plus a lot of other stuff. And next semester with uh, three or four of my grad students, we're gonna be doing a reading seminar and trying to get through a few chapters of this. So if anybody wants to join us, it's a one hour seminar, um, email me for more information. And at the end of the day, since I'm a seismologist and not a computational scientist, what I'm mostly interested in is finding um, some numerical solution to that elastic wave equation that's fast, accurate, and efficient. And I put the word efficient in there because I don't want to take up all the space on R2 and prevent other students from using it, okay? Um, and at the end of the day, I also would like rays or waves, and then I want to use those to do structure and source imaging. Um, so this is just an example. As a community, we have the computational infrastructure for geodynamics where students can go, researchers can go and find all kinds of existing codes for doing elastic wave simulation. And this is just one example. I'd say it's the state of the art. SpecFem 3D, they have a Cartesian version and they also have a global version, which is a big Fortran package that's parallel and runs on supercomputers. So these things are installed on R2, our students use them. Um, I wanted to put this slide in here just because I think it's important and I know lots of people over in math and computing look at these things, but from the seismic perspective, 
there's still things that we're trying to figure out. So this is a paper from 2020 where they are trying to think about how to mesh the earth the best still. So we do know the gross structure of a radial earth, which means we know the layers. And we know that there is some topography on those layers. For example, at the core mantle boundary, we have these super low velocity zones that potentially lead to plumes like Yellowstone. Um, and so we're constantly as a community trying to figure out, well, how, what should we do? Should we have some mesh refinement here? If you compare this to this, we're changing the mesh at the core mantle boundary so that we can allow for some of that topographic structure to occur. Um, the other thing is thinking about how far or how small we should take that mesh. So if you've ever looked at a rock, the heterogeneity of that rock goes to the microscopic level. You will see grains and things that you can just go down and down and down and there's still heterogeneity. And so we have to decide what is the limit that we want to go to. And as computers get more powerful and we can make smaller meshes, we can refine smaller heterogeneity in the earth. But compared to a lot of things like let's say mechanical engineering where they have a homogeneous piece of aluminum, it's easy to model elastic deformation in those things when everything is homogeneous. Um, and then the last thing is how do we parallelize and use modern architectures? And so uh, that comes down to domain decompositions, e efficient methods. And this is where I, again, get at the edge of my limits, but I go try to find people in other disciplines who can help me do that. So that sort of ends um, your intro to seismology and then what happens in sort of the computational forward problem. Um, and now I wanna go to the other part of the talk, which is seismic imaging. So if we can model these waves, and we can solve this PDE numerically, how do we actually use that information to study the structure of the earth? And so I pose this question, how does seismic imaging work? Um, if any of you have ever had an MRI, they put you in a little tube and they slide you through and you get really nice images back because of the fact that they have a source and a receiver that it completely encompasses the target or the human in this case. So they have a little sensor that shoots out a radio wave or an X-ray and a sensor from the other side that measures how it goes through there. And they, they're able to sensor from, uh, they're able to sample from every single direction, um, which is, we're gonna come to in a minute, but think of it as perfect illumination. They can study the object from all directions. Our attempt at that as a country in the US was this thing called the transportable array. So it's just finishing now in Alaska, but the idea was that we would stick a seismometer every degree of latitude and longitude for a period of two years across the US. And so these things are color coded by time because we sort of bought a bunch of stations and then once two years was up, we moved that station to the east. And then it sat there for two years and then we moved it to the east. So it's kind of leapfrogging. <clears throat> But this is our attempt to have a receiver everywhere in the lower US and Alaska so that we can do really awesome imaging of the crust and the mantle directly beneath us. The problem is we don't have sources everywhere. So this is for a global sort of perspective, but we have earthquakes that only happen on plate boundaries and we have huge gaps out here in the oceans where there's no sources and we have huge gaps out here in the oceans where there's no receivers. So on the bottom, I show you the sort of global distribution of broadband seismometers that a bunch of countries have put together and we use that for a variety of purposes. So the big takeaway here is that we have poor illumination in seismic imaging. And this is just a, a picture to show you what happens uh, when you have differences in illumination. It means you have shadow zones where you might not resolve things. And that's the big difference between seismic imaging and medical imaging. We have big gaps in our knowledge based on our sampling. So the traditional seismic tomography, and this is the same with medical tomography, relies on this geometric op optics approximation. So the data that we use are travel times. So if you go back and you think about those little waveforms I showed you, we could pick the arrival time of an S wave. That would be your data. 
And it is an integral along some path, P, and the path length in each of our grid cells for our discretized little world is ds, and the velocity in that little grid cell is c. Okay, so it's a very simple line integral, and you sum up the distance divided by the velocity, all the little times that it takes the wave to go through your model in each cell, and you get your total travel time. Um, P here does satisfy Snell's law or Descartes law. So you can have bent rays, you can have things that curve. Um, but at the end of the day, we're able to write this as some sort of linear uh, problem. So D a vector is equal to G a matrix times M. So M is one over C, your slowness is at all your different locations. And each row in G is all the little DSs that sum up together to give you the path for one data point. Okay, so D can either be a P wave or it can be an S wave time. And what that means is that C down here is either a P wave velocity or an S wave velocity. We usually do those two things separately. And because we don't have perfect illumination, we have to add regularization. And this is just an example to show you what happens in seismology. So all these red dots are receivers and sources and all of the black lines are the little paths that connect those. So you can see over here, we have really high sampling of the subsurface. We have paths going in all directions, which means it's gonna be well resolved. And then right here is an oil platform. And this oil platform was constantly shaking, which then made all of the seismograms around here too noisy to pick an actual arrival time. The background noise was too big and we couldn't pick it. So now we have a gap, okay? So we can either just eliminate that from the tomography or we can try to do some kind of regularization. And what we end up with then are things like this. So this is a ray density path. You can see where we have high uh, density rays, meaning probably good resolution. And we can also actually compute the resolution matrix from this linear inverse problem because it's a small scale problem. We're gonna see later, we can't do that. Uh, and we can sort of see where we have good resolution, where we have high path density and poor resolution around the edges and in here where we don't have data. And what we get out at the end of the day are maps that look like this, that say, here's the group velocity of a Rayleigh wave. And we see slow and fast zones. And what oil companies wanna do is look for things like this that's slow. It's maybe a basin or it's sediment that maybe has gas in the pore space, okay? So that's sort of straight ray tomography. It's a super simple inverse method. The hardest part here is computing G and you need some kind of ray tracer uh, that solves the iconal equation to do this. Um, the one thing I would add is based on the geometric optics approximation, we're assuming infinite frequency here. And what we actually know is that infinite frequency in the earth is not a, a good uh, approximation. Um, sources, oftentimes earthquakes generate lots of low frequencies and less high frequencies. And so in the late nineties, early two thousands, people developed this finite frequency tomography method. And finite frequency tomography is slightly different. We look now at perturbations in the wave field relative to some synthetic wave field. So we need a 1D model. We need uh, to synthetically predict, usually we do this analytically for very simple models, um, the wave field. And we look at the difference between those two. And we look actually at the frequency dependent difference. Uh, I didn't explicitly write that out here, but that's a second step. And what you then get is a perturbation in your data is still some integral that relates uh, your now three dimensions. So a voxel, let's say, instead of a path, a little volume to a perturbation in your model. And there's a kernel here. So this kernel is what is gonna show us frequency dependence. But at the end of the day, we still write this as delta D equals G times delta M. Okay, so we can compute this kernel and solve this with linear inverse methods. Um, for those of you, and I'm not, I said, I'm not going super into the math on this, but K is usually called the Frechet derivative. 
or in seismology, we call it a sensitivity kernel, and it's meant to replace the path. And in the example I'm going to show you, it's a global example. We're going to use a discretization that's called the cubed sphere. So the Earth is composed of six of these little cubes. And so this is an example of what one of those kernels looks like. It has a uh, uh, the ray here was showing you what was up previously, and now you have this kernel um, <clears throat> that you have off ray sensitivity. And these things change with frequency. So this is an example of what we would call long period or low frequency. Here's a source down here and a receiver up here. This is the wave that goes directly from the source to the receiver. And, and the other direction is the wave that goes around the earth from the other side to the receiver. So since we're on a sphere, we have things going in both directions. And what you see is that the kernel is not symmetric. We can actually start to incorporate the effects of the seismic moment tensor. So this little beach ball thing is how we say how the fault ruptured. And the other thing that you see is that this is so low frequency and this is high frequency, the width of this sensitivity zone changes. So if we were thinking about a ray, it would just be a single ray along here, but now we're able to sort of add some sensitivity to the model. And the way to interpret this is a velocity perturbation here has some influence on a measurement there. And when you go from blue to orange, it means that that um, effect has an opposite um, contribution on the data that you observe. The nice thing here is that we're incorporating more of the physics. So this still isn't the state of the art, but we still use this because it's a tractable problem that we can do on modern supercomputers. When you go from rays to sensitivity kernels, G is no longer sparse and the memory requirements for putting that matrix into memory get to be very large. Um, so for this example, we're talking tens of terabytes uh, to do global earth tomography. And then this is an example of what the, let's say, upper mantle structure looks like across the globe. And now we're looking at perturbations to the shear wave velocity because now, remember, everything is relative to whatever our synthetic initial model was. Um, and so the thing to take away is we have more accurate physics, but there's still lots of approximations. Um, but this is sort of a, a, an area that allows us to be, go beyond the, the ray-based stuff. Um, so I'm gonna go into the last thing now, which is full waveform inversion and see if I can end on time. Um, <clears throat> so where are we today? Uh, well, as a, as a community where we're pushing the limits uh, in the computational world and the imaging world is this thing called full waveform tomography. And it uses the full physics and it uses then an adjoint to the wave equation. And I did not put that there because that could be a whole talk. Um, but students can chat with Jody and I if you're interested in this. Um, it, the only approximations are in the actual numerics in the wave equation solution. So depending on how you decide to solve the forward problem, that's where the approximations pop up. We start writing things that look like this. So some kind of operator on U and M given some force. Um, we're not going to go deep into that other than to say that we need then some adjoint operator. Uh, and this becomes a nonlinear inverse problem. So for those of you that are familiar, we start to need iterative methods, gradient descents, things like this uh, to move through our misfit and minimize our misfit. Um, the other thing that it requires is a Jacobian and the Hessian. Uh, so there's lots of interesting research that goes on right now and how do we approximate the Hessian. So the Jacobian is an M by M matrix, depending on how many model parameters you have. This is an M times M by N times M. And this also starts to become huge when you want to put it into uh, actual computer memory. So my postdoc in Nice, I spent a whole lot of time thinking about how can we approximate these things or prior to that, condense our G matrix using things like singular value decomposition. Um, and in this approach, what's also nice is because we're, we're satisfying the full wave field, we can invert for the structure and the source or both. 
Okay, so we can do those things independently. And the way that this works and why it's computationally intensive is because you need three forward solutions to the wave equation to build a, a kernel, okay? So you have a regular wave field that is propagated from your source to your receiver. You need to record that all over and then you need to time reverse that wave field. So what you see here in this left-hand column is the regular wave field being played back in time T equals zero, T equals 46 seconds, T equals 96, T equals 104. So you see it's collapsing back on the star, which is the source. Then you also need the adjoint wave field. So this is a wave field that is propagated from the receiver and it's related to the misfit. So what was delta U? It's the difference between your initial prediction and your new prediction, or sorry, your initial prediction and your observed data and you take that difference and you stick it in this source or sorry this receiver and you propagate it back to the source so you have this wave field emanating going towards the source and what we do is we look at the interaction of the two wave fields so at this particular time they're interacting with with well, with each other here and you can think of this we're just correlating this wave field with that wave field and if you do that through time you build out your sensitivity kernel. And what's nice about this is that in the finite frequency world, we solved or built these sensitivity kernels analytically using simple radial earth models. Because we're doing an actual full simulation of the elastic wave field, you can have 3D structure in here and you get very complicated looking kernels, but they follow the true physics. It just gets heavy on the computing side. And so that's for one receiver and one source. And so lots of people are trying to play games of how can we inject multiple uh, adjoint fields at once? How can we do simultaneous sources? All these tricks um, because the oil industry in particular has thousands and thousands of sources and receivers. And so where we end up is with cool resolution things like this. So this is a, a model that we're trying to reconstruct. There's three cases here, one where these perturbations are either plus or minus 3%, that's up here. Another where the perturbations are plus or minus 6% or plus or minus 9%. And you can see that depending on the strength of the perturbation, we can resolve things pretty well, like the big blue box or these changes in positive and negatives. And then if you look as a, like a slice through here from zero down to about 400 meters depth, you can see how well we actually resolve all these sort of lateral heterogeneities. And so that's sort of our state of the art. We wanna be able to resolve as many features in the earth as we can and the higher frequency we go, the smaller wavelengths we have and the smaller features we can resolve. So I'm getting close to time and I'm gonna to try to wrap up with the last thing. So this has all been structure imaging. Um, Zongbo is a student who recently graduated and he was working on source imaging. And he spent a lot of time doing new derivations for how to figure out how a source in an area influences the seismic wave field. So he makes these kernels where now every point here is a potential source. And what the source does is it influences the cross correlation between two receivers. And we now can do things like this. So this is a gas flux study where the gas CO2 is degassing from the subsurface and generating seismic waves. Blue is the gas flux measurements. And in red is Zongbo's estimate of where the sources are being generated over a three hour period. And in the left is just the comparison, black is the waveforms that we actually recorded and red are our new predictions using a full waveform, full waveform tomography for imaging the source. Um, another thing that we've been working on is related to sea ice. So this is um, summer in Antarctica, no sea ice, very strong seismic energy, the bright red. Once the sea ice grows in the let's say, uh, what is that, springtime, it's at its sort of max, you see the energy decreases. So there's a little seismic station that's sitting here watching the waves hit the coast. So when there's no sea ice, lots of energy. When there's sea ice, not so much energy. And you see that this just changes at the very annual pattern through the seasons. So one of the things we're working on now 
is can we actually locate where those sources are coming from using the seismic wave field? So here's the initial synthetic model. No sea ice, lots of sources. And here's what we're able to recover. And keep in mind the accuracy of our recovery is entirely related to this geometry of the recording stations in Antarctica. So we could do better if we spent more money and put more stations in Antarctica. Um, okay, and so then where does full waveform tomography go? I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that, but we need to do improvements in uncertainty quantification. So a big group of our community is looking at stochastic inverse methods. We would love to have more complex wave equations. So viscoelastic, it gets to be, you have attenuation now and the adjoints change. Um, there's some new papers where people are working on reformulating the equation of motion so that an adjoint exists. Pore elastic is important. We want to be able to accurately monitor fluid migration through the subsurface in petroleum and water reservoirs, as well as geothermal and volcanoes. Here's an example of a porous rock. Um, and then we also want to take into account anisotropy. We know that the minerals in the mantle grow with preferred orientations and they cause anisotropy, meaning velocities in one direction are faster than velocities in the other. And what that means is this stress equation is related, well, stress then is no longer just two physical constants, but it's related to strain through this 81 component uh, elasticity tensor. And then the other thing is that we need some kind of resolution analysis. So we actually can't compute the resolution matrix for real world problems. So we need ways other ways to do that. So people do sort of random sampling of our big uh, matrices and a bunch of things like that. So my conclusions, in general, the imaging problem suffers from the accuracy of the forward model. This is to tie back into this computation theme. Uh, we need fast and accurate numerical solutions to the wave equation and better images require more computer power and higher memory so that we can make finer meshes. Um, and achieve the sort of resolution that we would like. And there's lots of areas for continued improvement. And I would just make the caveat that a lot of technology that is in other fields like medical imaging came from seismology first because we have this problem of poor illumination and we've had to be very creative in how we overcome that. And the oil industry in particular has invested a lot of money in um, physics and science and math to try to come up with some solutions when you have poor illumination of the subsurface. And we can go here, but what happens in seismology, machine learning? So the way that we detect events is currently uses this thing called autocorrelation. We're finding that we can do much faster event detection with convolutional neural networks. We can go uh, from months of data down and get it to a few hours of, or well, not even hours of runtime, whereas that with traditional methods is terrible. Um, we're using convolutional neural networks to pick the arrival times for us and distinguish P and S waves. This is just an example. Um, and then we're using machine learning to improve images. So we denoise images and try to find, let's say, these little high reflectivity areas that might have oil or something like that. 